This is one of nine in the series The Justified Walk by Pastor Frank Phillips. Feel free to copy and share. I'd like to have you this morning let your mind to go with me. Back about three months ago when I was in the state of Oregon and down along the ocean beach, we were holding a series of meetings there in a small church and the pastor came to service one night and he said you're supposed to make a telephone call. I made the telephone call and on the other end of the line I was talking with Dan Augsburger and he gave me the invitation to come out here. Now it's a long way from there to here and that was a little church. But you know we have found some of the greatest blessings speaking to some of the congregations of little churches. Spirit of God worked mightily, and he has, and I stand before you here delighted today that I can speak for the Lord Jesus Christ in this wonderful message of righteousness by faith. You have in your hand a handout that will not give you exactly the outline of the message that you're going to be listening to in the next 45 minutes, but it will help you and be a guide to you in future study, I hope. This was prepared for a series of meetings that we conducted at Loma Linda University. That may be a no-no here, I'm not sure. But uh, it uh, certainly was one of the most precious meetings, the most marvelous meetings that we have held. And uh, so the questions at the bottom of the page you need pay no attention to. The scripture references, in case you do not have your Bible with you, are there. The uh, quotations are a few of those that we'll be using. You'll note that in our series of meetings we are speaking for the first three meetings on the life of Jesus Christ because in reality we are told that we should study the life of Christ, for he is our only perfect example. Do you believe that? Amen. I think sometimes we study it from the wrong angle. We're going to try and study it from the right angle in the next three meetings. Learn from it something that possibly you have never seen before. At least we hope that that will be the result. Then beginning on Sunday night, we will begin talking about justification. And Monday night we will continue on the subject of justification. Tuesday night we will talk about the power of the will and how and where it fits into the program of righteousness by faith. And then Wednesday and Thursday nights we will be speaking on sanctification, its relationship, how it relates to justification. That's just a brief glimpse of what we're planning, and we just trust the Lord for his blessing on each service. Our message for today is based on the subject that we find, the scripture reference we find in Matthew 16 and verse 24. And there we find Jesus saying to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Chris, the author Hannah Whittle Smith, in her book, The Christian's Secret of a Happy Life, tells of an experience that she had at one time that changed her life. She said that while she was in a certain place, a gentleman cultured gentleman came up to her and she sa he said to her, you Christians seem to have a religion that makes you miserable. You're like a man with a headache. <clears throat> he does not want to get rid of his head, but it hurts him to keep it. <laughs> then uh, he went on and he said, you cannot expect outsiders to seek very earnestly for anything so uncomfortable as that. And Hannah Whittle Smith began to realize that Possibly Christianity has not been presented in its most attractive light. And I think there's a lot of truth to this. You see, books are written, 
sermons are preached, testimonials are given and listened to, and still there are very few Christian people who understand and are practicing the more abundant life. And this is a tragedy. If you could go with me from church to church, meeting thousands of people, you would realize that what Ellen White said in 1890 that our religion is at a low ebb is even more so today, an extremely low ebb. Individuals who have lived their lives for years as Christian people and still have not experienced that which Jesus has promised. And we say actually is, is Jesus unable to fulfill that which he has actually promised us? Listen for just a moment. Hebrews 7, verse 25 says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. In Colossians 1, 13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. In Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Romans 8:37 Nay in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. John 1:12 But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14 Now thanks be unto God which always causeth us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Are these a reality in your life today? It was Charles G Trumbull in his book victory in Christ, who said that when he was rather a young man, he attended a convention in Chicago, and there was one thought that kept bombarding his mind from speaker after speaker, and the thought was a simple expression, is your kind of Christianity worth sending to the world? Not is Christianity worth sending, that we know. But is the kind of Christianity you lived last week, yesterday, even this morning, last night, is that kind of Christianity worth sending to the world? It's a sobering thought. You see, there's only one kind of Christianity that is worth sending to the world, and that's the kind of Christianity that Jesus lived. That's the only kind. And that's the kind of Christianity that Satan is trying to confuse in the minds of men and women, and especially in the youth. You see, Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets on page 41, it was his policy to perplex with subtle arguments concerning the purposes of God. Everything that was simple he shrouded in mystery and by artful perversion cast doubt upon the plainest statements of Jehovah. Do you know where this is written of? This is written of actually what Satan did in the heavenly courts above. That's what happened when he started dealing with angels. He took the very simplest statements of God and shrouded them in mystery so the angels were almost, it was almost impossible for them to comprehend what God was saying. And he twisted it just with a little twist. Do you know that's exactly what he did with Eve? And he's been doing it with the human family ever since. That's why we read in First Sel and Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 345, He, Satan, seeks to make mysterious that which is simple and plain. He's had long experience in this work. I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Romans 8, 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. John 1, 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Are these a reality in your life today? It was Charles G. Trumbull in his book, Victory in Christ, who said that when he was rather a young man, he attended a convention in Chicago, 
And there was one thought that kept bombarding his mind from speaker after speaker, and the thought was a simple expression, is your kind of Christianity worth sending to the world? Not is Christianity worth sending. That we know. But is the kind of Christianity you lived last week, yesterday, even this morning, last night, is that kind of Christianity worth sending to the world? It's a sobering thought. You see, there's only one kind of Christianity that is worth sending to the world, and that's the kind of Christianity that Jesus lived. That's the only kind. And that's the kind of Christianity that Satan is trying to confuse in the minds of men and women, and especially in the youth. You see, Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets on page 41, it was his policy to perplex with subtle arguments concerning the purposes of God. Everything that was simple he shrouded in mystery and by artful perversion cast doubt upon the plainest statements of Jehovah. Do you know where this is written of? This is written of actually what Satan did in the heavenly courts above. That's what happened when he started dealing with angels. He took the very simplest statements of God and shrouded them in mystery, so the angels were almost, it was almost impossible for them to comprehend what God was saying. And he twisted it just with a little twist. Do you know that's exactly what he did with Eve? And he's been doing it with the human family ever since. That's why we read in First Sel and Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 345, He, Satan, seeks to make mysterious that which is simple and plain. He's had long experience in this work, 6,000 years nearly. That's a long time. And he's had no other goal than to confuse just the simple truths. You see, he doesn't care how much you study the prophecies of God's Word. He doesn't care how much you study the complicated theological problems that you'll find in God's Word, and there are some. He cares nothing about all of that. That's confusing enough. And there are opinions galore and solutions galore. But young people and older ones as well, Satan does not want you or me to understand the simple truth of God's Word. That's where salvation lies, and that's why he is trying to confuse the issue so much. It's in the simple truths. That's why we're speaking on Jesus' simple words, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and then follow me. A three-step program that is an absolute essential to following Jesus. The setting of this is found in Desire of Ages, page 416 and 17, where we read Jesus now explained to his disciples that his own life of self-abnegation, please note the word, self-abnegation, was an example of what there should be. Calling about him, with the disciples, the people who had been lingering near, he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The cross was associated with the power of Rome. To the disciples, his words, though dimly comprehended, this was the way it always was. The disciples scarcely ever comprehended what Jesus was saying. You remember often they said, we don't know what he means. They loved him. They loved him vehemently, but they didn't understand him. And there are many, many people who today read God's word. They love God's word. They feel some kind of a elation and some kind of a blessing when they read it, but they don't understand it especially the simple truths. The disciples were just exactly the same way. And the disciples, to the disciples, his words, though dimly comprehended, pointed to their submission to the most bitter humiliation, submission even unto death. Why? 
You see, if you had lived at the time of Jesus on this world and you had seen a cross, it wouldn't have meant to you then what it means now. For at that time it meant only one thing, death. For it was a symbol of Rome. It was the way that Rome chose to actually get rid of the most violent criminals. And anyone who wore a cross or carried a cross you knew was going to die. Disciples looking on knew what this meant, even unto death for the sake of Christ. No more complete self-surrender could the Savior's words have possibly spoken. That's the extreme. Jesus could never have said anything that would have impressed them any greater. In Elder Mead McGuire's book, the little, uh, his little book, The Life of Victory, page 35, we read undoubtedly the great difficulty with the majority of believers that they are trying to live Christ's life without having first died Christ's death. They seem to have a notion that Christ died so that we need not die, so that through faith in Christ they hope to live without dying. Paul says, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8, 8. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. Romans, uh, Galatians 5 and verse 24. And if that's not clear enough for us to understand, Ellen White adds to it by her statement in Selected Messages 1, page 224, let no one seek to evade the cross. It is through the cross that we are enabled to overcome. It is through affliction and trial that divine agencies carry on a work in our lives that will result in the love and peace and kindness of our Savior. You see, when Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. That word deny himself, those words, that little expression, is full of meaning. So full of meaning that Satan took this simple statement and actually, with a simple twist, has confused the whole Christian world. For you see, what he has done is simply turn self-denial into denying self. Just reverse. And we hear much today about self-denial. But how much do we hear about denying self? And there's a vast difference, you see. A vast difference. For actually, when we think of self-denial, we think of someone who has gone without, done without, for the benefit of someone else. Is that true? That's exactly what comes into our mind. Someone who is saved up for something that they need desperately and a call comes and then they generously give that which they needed for themselves for the greater call. And we say, my, what wonderful self-denial. And that's true. And I'm not belittling that kind of thing in any sense of the word. But I just want you to know one thing, and that is that uh, that has no saving grace. No saving power. But denying self is an entirely different thing. Now, if you should look up in the dictionary, or should go to the original language and try and find a clear and concise definition for the word deny, you'd be pretty hard-pressed because it just isn't clear. To deny is to utterly deny, and that doesn't help you very much. It doesn't give you very much. You see, this particular word in the Greek that Jesus used here was not used too many times in the New Testament, and it seems that Jesus was the chief user of this particular word, this particular Greek word, deny. And you can probably understand why when we understand what he meant. And the only way we can understand what he meant is to take the places where he used it. And you see, in this particular reference, he used it three different times. And in Luke, he adds one dimension to it. He said, uh, 
deny himself, take up his cross, and he adds one word. Do you know what it is? Daily. Daily. Take up his cross daily, then come and follow me. But you see, the word deny was there. But then he does use it in one place that will help us a great deal. And that's in the last verse of the 26th chapter of the book of Matthew. It's the 75th verse. That's a chapter with lots and lots of verses. And in the 75th verse there we find these words. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus which said unto him, Before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Now, you have no problem knowing what the word deny meant. Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me. What did Peter do? He denied, but yes, what did he do when he denied? He said, I don't know this man. I have nothing to do with him. I never did know him. I'll have nothing to do with him at all. You have the wrong man entirely. I am not connected in any way with this man. Thrice he went through this little ordeal and then went out and wept bitterly for having denied his Lord, completely rejected him, rejected any knowledge of it. Now then, with this definition clearly in your mind, can you make the transition? Jesus said, this is what every one of us have to do toward what? Or who? Self. Self. There has to be a complete and absolute separation. That's why, you see, Paul says, they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. That's why Owen White says, let no one seek to evade the cross. For it is through the cross that salvation is actually found and victory is attained. Let no one seek to evade it. Oh, it's, it's such a more comfortable way to try and evade that cross and uh, avoid dying. Because dying to self is not an easy thing. May I suggest to you today that actually there is no other plan for that's exactly the way Jesus lived his life on earth? That's the only way that he could live his life here on earth. You see, Ellen White gives to us another statement in volume 5 of Bible Commentary 10, 90, and 91. The yoke and the cross are symbols representing the same thing. The giving up of the will to God. Wearing the yoke unites infinite, or unites finite man in a companionship with the dearly beloved Son of God. I get my... Lifting the cross cuts away self from the soul and places man where he learns how to bear Christ's burdens. Lifting the cross and actually wearing the yoke are symbols of the same thing. We cannot follow Christ without wearing his yoke, without lifting the cross and bearing it after him. It's an absolute essential. You see, when we take an honest look at it this way, we began to realize that step number one then is to be willing to die to self. Step number two then, bearing the cross, is a continuous bearing of this cross by continuing to die to self. How? As Luke tells us, daily. It is a matter of daily. Yes, Paul goes even farther, and in 2 Corinthians 4 and verses 10 to 12, Paul says, bearing about in my body the dying of the Lord. Always bearing about. For we which live are always delivered unto death. And I suggest to you that this Paul learned when he was out there in the Arabian desert from the Lord Jesus Christ himself and he was secure in that. And that's why we learn that when self is woven into our labors, when the truth we bear to others does not sanctify and ennoble our own hearts, it will not testify that we are fit vessels for the master's use. 
Oh, it's so easy for me to say, Christ helps me to do this. He helps me to do that. And we've heard it preached, and unfortunately, we believed it. May I suggest to you that Jesus Christ is not in the helping business? That may come as a bit of a shock to you. But it's either he who does it and does it all, or else it isn't done. And it has to be. We are unable to actually allow him, or he is unable, I should say, to allow us to do part of it. There's no part that we can do. And we must recognize this. And yet, there is a part that we do. And we must recognize that too. But it's not what we think. And we'll learn that as we go through this series of meetings. You see, the object of all ministry is to keep self out of sight and to let Christ appear. That's one selected message as 155. The object of all ministry is to keep self out of sight. And that brings me to the quotation that you'll find on your little handout sheet there, page of volume 7, 930. And there these words are given to us, the most potent, that will help us to understand how Jesus lived his life. It was a difficult task for the Prince of Life to carry out the plan which he had undertaken for the salvation of man in clothing his divinity with humanity. He had received honor in the heavenly courts and was familiar with absolute power. Do you understand that? I don't. I don't think there's anyone here that does. All I know is the Bible says he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. He was familiar, not acquainted with, but he was familiar with absolute power. There was nothing that, he could, that could have been done that Jesus could not do and did do. He created all things in heaven above and in earth below, everywhere. He simply was the creator, familiar with absolute power. Now notice, it was as difficult for him to keep the level of humanity as for man to rise above the low level of their depraved natures and be partakers of the divine nature. Do you have any difficulty in that department? Do you? Isn't that where all of our difficulties are? There isn't a single problem that we face that is not right there. Right there. And it was just as difficult with Jesus. Can you imagine that? Jesus having his difficult time in keeping his divinity clothed with humanity so that not one time in his lifetime by his own will was his divine nature revealed. Not one time. Never once did he dare allow that divine nature to show through. You see, when you catch this view, you began to realize then that Jesus was indeed tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Oh, there have been many, many men who have stumbled over that. They say, Jesus didn't have the temptations that I have because he had sinless nature. I have sinful nature. And so he couldn't have been tempted as I am tempted. Oh, how blind we are. For he was tempted in all points just the same. What were his temptations? Why, the temptations of Jesus, you see, were especially geared by Satan. You see, it's rather interesting because when we recognize that when Jesus came to this earth, he came in sinless nature. That's why we read in volume 7a, page 650 of the Bible commentary, Christ came to the earth taking humanity and standing as man's representative to show in the controversy with Satan that man as God created him 
connected with the Father and the Son, could obey every divine requirement. You see, Jesus had absolute sinless nature. And when you understand this, then you understand that that's the only baby that's ever been born on this entire planet that's ever been born that way. The only one. Do you know what that did to Satan? Why, it threw him in total confusion. Why? For the simple reason, you see, selfishness is revealed in every child that's born in this planet within a few hours of birth. Am I right? If you don't believe it, you work in a nursery, and you'll find it out. Within a few hours of birth, selfishness sticks out all over them. And do you know that uh, the devil sits back and says, I've got another one started? Down the same road. That road has never failed. It's always been that way. But you see, when he tried with Jesus to develop that selfishness, even as he was a small child, it didn't work. And Satan was totally confused. And so he had to switch his whole method of temptation because he found out that he couldn't tempt Jesus to do bad things. He tried. He tried. He tried desperately, you see. In Desire of Ages, page 759, we read, From the time when he appeared as a babe in Bethlehem, the usurper, Satan, worked to bring about his destruction. In every way possible, he sought to prevent Jesus from developing a perfect childhood, a faultless manhood, a holy ministry, and an unblemished character. But praise God, he failed. Jesus developed that perfect manhood, that faultless character, and he offers to give it to you and to me. You see, in uh, volume 7a of commentary 649, we read, no man looking upon the Christ-like countenance shining in animation could say that Christ was just like other children. There had been never a, bo a child born like Christ. Never one. He was God in human flesh. Never forget it. But you see, Satan had prided himself for 4,000 years of time from the very beginning, realizing that he had gotten things so well organized and going in his plan that Jesus would have to become human. And when he became human, he would have no more problem with Christ than he would have with any other baby. But when it didn't work, then he had to back off and start in again. And so he tempted Christ from the time that he was a little child to manifest that which was inherent and natural in him. May we just turn the coin over and uh, say, what does he tempt you to do and me to do? Is it not to reveal that which is natural in which we are born, that nature? Is not that his greatest temptation to you, to actually cause that human, natural, sinful nature to come out, even though you're a born-again Christian? That's where his temptations are constantly. But let's take a look at how that cross was borne by our loving Lord. From his earliest years, Jesus was guarded by heavenly angels, yet his life was one long struggle against the powers of darkness. Did this give him an advantage? No. Are we not also commissioned and guarded by heavenly angels from birth? Oh, yes. You see... Because his life was a life that condemned evil, he was opposed both at home and abroad. Both at home and abroad. How much was he actually opposed at home? Let me read to you. 88, Desire of Ages. Of the bitterness that falls the lot of humanity, there was no part, no part that Christ did not taste. There were those who tried to cast contempt upon him because of his birth. They said, we know who our dad is, but... You don't even know who your dad is. Do you know who was casting that kind of a remark in his teeth? It was his own brothers, the own members of the family, Joseph's sons. They were the ones who constantly were keeping at him. Can you see 
how easy it would have been for Jesus to have cleared matters up? Let me just read to you. He had to meet their scornful looks and evil whisperings. If he had responded by an impatient word or look, wait a minute now, let's read that again. If he had responded by what? An impatient word or what? You see, Christ couldn't even grit his teeth. He didn't resist by determination. Have you ever done that? Is that the way you live your Christian life? You see, he is the only perfect example. If he had responded by an impatient word or look, if he had conceded to his brothers by even one wrong act, he would have failed at being a perfect example. Oh, I'm glad he didn't, aren't you? I certainly am. Thus he would have failed of carrying out the plan for our redemption. Had he even admitted that there was even an excuse for sin, the whole plan would have been ruined. Uh, have you ever committed a sin that you didn't blame it upon people or circumstances? Have you? It's never your fault, I'm sure. I know that's the way it's been with me. I always find some circumstance or person to blame it on. If you hadn't said that, you've never said that, I'm sure. But you see, that's the way the human nature is. But praise God, Jesus had an entirely different nature. You see, in his youth, he had to learn the hard lessons of patient endurance. Patient endurance. We can endure, but put it, uh, putting the other with it is a more difficult task. You see, we're told Jesus loved his brothers and treated them with unfailing kindness, but they were jealous of him, manifested the most decided unbelief and contempt. Unbelief in what? Who he was. That's what they didn't believe. They said, you think you're somebody. And he had to meet this constantly, knowing who he was. At 12 years of age, he went to the temple with his folks and confused, confounded the doctors of the law, the priests, because he knew what it was all about. He looked at those sacrifices and he saw himself represented there. He knew the whole picture and he asked those priests, what do these mean? And they didn't even know. Why, they'd been going through the routine of their religious program for so many generations of time that the sacrifices had lost their meaning entirely. Has religion become that in your life? Is it a round of activity? Jesus saw exactly what it was, and yet his own brothers were constantly challenging him with this thought. And oh, what an easy thing it would have been for Christ to have changed the whole picture. How easy? Let me read it to you. Page 700 of Desire of Ages. Thus, when Christ was treated with contempt, there came to him a strong temptation to manifest his divine character by a word, listen now, by a word or look, he could compel his persecutors to confess that he was Lord above kings and rulers, priests and temple. Oh, what a temptation. Just by a look, he could have compelled them all to have bowed before him. But he didn't. He didn't one time use that power. He kept that natural nature of his completely clothed, hidden from view. We only find a couple of times when actually he revealed that nature. One of them was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And you remember he had three of his disciples there. And he said, Father, Father, just let these, these men see the glory that I had with you before the world was. And Jesus' divinity flashed through him. You see, that was because the Father chose to have this done. Jesus would not do it, except by God saying, that's it. Oh, what a, what a Savior. We read 
By a word or look, he could compel his persecutors to confess that he was Lord above kings and rulers, priests and temple itself, but he was, it was his difficult task to keep to the position he had chosen as one with humanity. That's why we read in volume 5, Bible Commentary 1081, to keep his glory veiled as a child of the fallen race was the most severe discipline to which he could subject himself. Nothing, nothing in any way could have been more severe in the life of Christ. There's nothing any more severe in your life and in mine than to keep our own sinful natures dead and buried. That's why Paul says if you are buried with him in baptism, you also shall be risen with him in his resurrection. You see, there's another dimension here. And if you'll just tolerate just a couple of more minutes here with me, we read in volume 7a 451 while it was he was free christ was free from every taint of sin the refined sensibilities of his holy nature rendered contact with evil unspeakably painful to him did you ever suffer pain because you simply came in contact with sin oh you you may have had some sadness Unless it is one of your very close relatives, somebody real close to you, then you might have even suffered some pain. But the simple, hard, cold, stark facts are that we can watch sin and laugh at it while the heart of God in the heavens above is grieving, weeping. You say, not me. I wish that were true. I wish that were true. But we can watch a drunk staggering down the street and smile. Brothers and sisters, it grieves the heart of God and his heart bleeds when he sees something like that because that's a child of God. The potential of a servant of God is there. And he loves him. That's how he can love the drunk in the street because love you see, he reaches down and loves for the potential in another, not just simply because of what we do. God doesn't love us for what we do, for if that were the case, he would not have any love for any of us. He loves us for the potential that he knows is there. And I pray God that we'll let that potential be developed by him and not by us. Because as we try and develop that potential, it turns out to be selfishness. But if he develops it, it's selflessness. And there's a great difference there. You see, while much that we call pleasure here amuses us as the angels in heaven and inhabitants on other worlds look down and see us enjoying the world, they say, when will, it, when will sin become offensive to them? You see, this is a part of God's plan in the message of righteousness by faith. For that plan is intended and designed to cause men to hate sin as Jesus hated it. To hate sin, not to just simply resist sin. Resisting sin will never, ever bring victory to your heart. God must bring you and me to the point where we hate sin with a perfect hatred as Jesus did. And praise God, he can and will do that if we will let him do it. But we must live our lives as he lived his. You see, Satan knew the weak points of the human heart. And on that same page, 930 of Volume 7, Bible Commentary, we read, Christ was put to the closest test, requiring 
the strength of all his faculties to resist the inclination when in danger to use his power to deliver himself from peril and triumph over the powers of the prince of darkness. Satan showed his knowledge of the weak points of the human heart and put forth his utmost power to take advantage of the weakness of humanity which Christ had assumed. What is that? You see, that is simply to let self show through. Christ, uh, Satan doesn't care what avenue, what course of study, what choice you have made for your life work. He doesn't care whether it's the ministry or whether it is truck driving. There's only one goal that he has, and that is in your work to let self be the dominant factor. And he doesn't care at all what work it is. If he can let self show through and if he can cause it to show through in your life and mine, he has us and it doesn't make one difference what our profession might be. And that's a sobering thought. You see, when we realize this, then we began to understand why we read in Desire of Ages, page 664, Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that man may not have through faith in him. For you see, his perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as he was in subjection to God. Can we then understand why it is so important to understand and to study the life of Jesus? For he was our perfect example, not for us to emulate. Please, let's get it clear at the very beginning. He is not our pattern for us to follow in the things that he did, but the way that he lived. And there's a vast difference. For you see, if we try and do the things that Jesus did, we find ourselves constantly confused. If we try and live the way he lived, we find the road to peace, joy, and happiness. May God bless you. And we'll continue in the life of Jesus at 4.30 this afternoon. Thank you for listening. We invite you to contact us for the rest of the series, or we also have several other series by Pastor Frank Phillips. Pastor Phillips also wrote a book titled His Robe and Mine. All this media is available to you for free, and many people are using it for group sessions and Bible studies. You can contact us for your free copies at www.justifiedwalk.com. You can also email us at justifiedwalk at justifiedwalk.com. You can also write us at the Justified Walk, P.O. Box 233, Berrien Springs, Michigan, 49103. Please feel free to copy and share these timely messages with those you know and those you meet.